A subscription to the China Africa Project's email newsletter is like getting a daily China Africa intelligence briefing delivered straight to your inbox every weekday at 6 a.m. Washington time. You'll get an in-depth review of everything going on in politics, trade, tech, culture, and more. And we don't just focus only on Africa, but also the Middle East and what China's doing throughout the Global South. Try it out free for 30 days. See if you like it. After that, subscriptions are just $7 a month for teachers and students and $15 a month for everyone else. Sign up today at ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. Once again, that's ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa-China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP aims to improve the quality of reporting on Africa-China relations through reporting grants, workshops, and other opportunities for journalists. More information at africachinareporting.co.za and our dedicated training website at africachinatraining.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, it is coming towards the end of the year. It's also now, oh, we are two weeks away from the big FOCAC summit. And that's got me thinking about all of these different emotions that kind of came out today in my column. And I was in a I don't know any other way to say it, but just a pissed off mood after reading all of the news that's been coming out on the debt markets in Africa. News coming out of Kenya today is that the depreciating shilling is forcing up borrowing costs. And it's really about putting enormous burdens on the Kenyan government to service its debts. Similar situation going on in Ghana and also in Zimbabwe, where the IMF is now warning that it is reaching unsustainable levels of debt. And it just got me thinking back to the past year. And Kobus, I mean, you reviewed my, my piece today and you were like, wow. <laughs> it, it's just in, incredible to think that nobody now, nobody seems to give a crap about what's going on. Like the debt issue in Africa has just moved on. And I started going through some of the past events over the past year. Do you remember the private creditor working group that came out? I think it was in May of last year. That's when the bondholders said, we're going to get together and we're going to work country by country to help resolve some of the debt issues. Guess what? Nothing happened. Do you remember when the New York State legislature, two lawmakers in New York State, Gustavo Rivera and Maritza Davila, they came out with this proposed legislation to really crack down on hedge funds and really loosen the hedge funds' abilities to resist sovereign debt restructurings. And this is very important because the state of New York oversees the Wall Street hedge funds. What came out of that? Nothing. And then we have, of course, the debt service suspension initiative from the G20. The G20, the same G20 that in Rome just a few weeks ago made no mention of debt relief, not one. They buried in the communique at point 11 questions about debt relief. 11, okay? I mean, it's just, and, they, and, and here's the amazing thing. If you look at the communique from the Rome summit, and then look at the communique from the finance minister and central bank ministers meeting in July. It literally is a copy paste. I mean, they're not even pretending to care anymore. I mean, not even they're not even pretending to care anymore. And so then they have this idea of the common framework. This is their new thing. Why? Because the DSSI is going to expire in six weeks. It's finished. And it's going to be replaced by this thing called the Common Framework, which up until now, get this, only three countries, Chad, Zambia, and Ethiopia, have signed up for. I mean, Kobus, I don't know what to say, but and everybody's to blame here. The Chinese are to blame. The U.S. is to blame. The Europeans are to blame. Africans are to blame. There is blame to go all the way around. But at the end of the day, the guy on the street and the gal on the street in Nairobi and in, in Accra are paying the price for all of this. Yeah, I mean it's 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 very worrying, and it's uh, you know 
you know, as you said, there's been very low uptake on the the common framework. There was also quite low uptake on on the DSSI itself. Um, you know, partly because some countries that 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 did kind of like you know join the initiative ended up being downgraded by ratings agencies, and, and I'm sure that that kind of sent a chill through the entire the entire process. But um, you know, kind of like it's 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 very interesting for me that there isn't kind of more interest from African countries, and I think you know overall. At some stage, you know, kind of everyone is probably going to have to call it as as a massive failure, um, you know, because in the end, like very little debt actually got cancelled. Almost all of the the it was simply a deferral of servicing payments. So it, so the, those payments still have to be made down the down the road, um, you know. So so it, it's just this is just this kind of really kind of glaring failure, you know, um, of of the kind of global community in the face of a of a global pandemic. You know, it's it's really shocking. Well, it's one of many failures this year. I mean, vaccines is another major failure. So there's a lot to to be held for account right now. We have another opportunity, though, to do something about this coming up at FOCAC. It is coming up again at the end of the month. And, And this is a chance. It doesn't look like debt relief is going to be very high on the agenda. But let's take a look at it today. And this is what we're going to focus on today is some of the economic implications of FOCAC. We're going to look at it from two perspectives, and we're thrilled to have these perspectives on the show today. And we're bringing uh, two guests on who contributed to a wonderful preview document that came out by the London School of Economics, the China Foresight team there. Uh, It's called FOCAC at 21, Future Trajectories of China-Africa Relations. It included some amazing Sino-African scholars like Lina Ben Abdallah, Yushan Wu, and Chris Alden, among others. And two of those authors are with us today. We're very thrilled to have on the show for the first time Stephen Paduno, who is the executive director of the LSE Economic Diplomacy Commission and a doctoral researcher at the London School of Economics. A very good morning to you, Stephen. Thanks for having me. And then also, we're very, very excited to have on the show for the first time as well, Mzukisi Kobo, who is the head of the Witt School of Governance at Witt University in Johannesburg. A very good afternoon to you, Mzukisi. Good afternoon, Eric. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. It's wonderful to have both of you here. Again, we're going to get two perspectives. First, let's start with you, Stephen. Uh, It's an interesting time for China to be holding a conference like this, in part because of some of the really profound changes that have been going on in the Chinese economy. And some of this is due to the pandemic, and some of it is just due to the natural evolution. After 40 years of real rapid growth, the Chinese economy has reached a, a certain limit in its growth and is now starting to behave a lot more like a mature economy. And instead of the 8 9 10% growth rates that we've seen for much of the past 30, 35 years, they're coming back down to earth into the 2 to 4%. And that, in many respects, is optimistic. Last year, there were suspicions that it was even lower than that. But then on top of that, we've had these crises that have come on in terms of the shortages of electricity, the Evergrande crisis, big economic policy pivots related to Xi Jinping in terms of his Common Prosperity Initiative, and then this thing called dual circulation. Can you walk us through, Stephen, since you focus on these issues, some of the dynamics in the Chinese economy that may impact how China behaves abroad in its overseas financing and at events like FOCAC? So this is certainly an interesting time uh, for China to be discussing investing overseas because one of the core elements of of this pivot that's going on, what people have been sort of awaiting for many years, they call it the rebalancing of China's economy, rebalancing from export and investment-led growth to consumption-led growth. And one of the things that that means is really reining in overseas investments. And it's Not always clear to outsiders why that would necessarily be the case, Um, but there's this very simple and very powerful concept in economics called the balance of payments. And what that says is that money into a country in the form of export earnings is going to equal money out. So if you have, if you're running a large trade surplus, you are going to have large overseas investments. Economists talk about this in terms of having a large current account surplus means having a large capital account deficit as money is leaving the country. The thing is that China wants to now change this. Um, and they've been talking about changing it since at least 2007. There's this famous uh, criticism from Wen Jiaobao, the premier at the time, who referred to the four uns. It was unstable, uncoordinated, unsustainable, um, 
and there was another one that I'm now forgetting, growth. But the, the, the concept that this, this couldn't go on because China was not relying on organic domestic consumption. So the whole point of this, of this dual circulation initiative that, that came about um, in 2020 um, was to pivot towards the internal circulation of goods. So kind of with any Chinese initiative, it has this name that sort of obfuscates what's going on. But the internal circulation being not just relying on foreign demand, on exports, but also on internal demand, on on people being able to buy things. Um, that now has become, in a way, common prosperity. And we've seen Xi Jinping come out a couple of times and call for genuine rather than inflated growth. Genuine growth being consumption-led growth, inflated growth, meaning the government coming in and investing in the domestic economy in order to meet uh, growth targets. Um, but we're now, in in the past couple of days, it, it seems as if there's been some easing up on, on this dual circulation, common prosperity, rebalancing of China's economy. So the, the upshot of all of this is that if China is actually able to rebalance, um, and see more consumption-led growth in their economy, there will be fewer overseas investments. If China is unable to rebalance, then we're going to see a continuation of the overseas investments that we've had for the past two decades at FOCAC and three decades sort of in the pre-FOCAC era. So in, in the LSE report, you write that the China's going out phase might be might be coming to an end or might be by, might be shifting something new. What kind of... Like takeaways, would you like African policymakers to, you know, kind of to focus on um, in relation to the dual circulation system, you know, kind of at FOCAC and, and, and now on? Like, what, you know, what should they keep in mind about dual circulation in their own planning with their, uh, of their own dealings with China? If we see a decline in overseas investments because there's a rise in domestic consumption, there will initially be some concern. You know, oh no, China is no longer investing abroad. But in reality, if we see this this rise in domestic consumption, that would be very good for most African economies. There would be some that would be a bit more disadvantaged because China will shift, presumably shift its consumption from industrial inputs, so raw commodities and such, to manufactured goods. But that would be very good for any country that is trying to ascend the development ladder and get into you know, higher value forms of, of production. So the thing to watch if I'm uh, an African policymaker is to sort of push for market access in the way of, in the way of rising consumption. So you want China, you, it sounds strange, but you want China to do this. You want China to rebalance. You want to see that decline in overseas investment because what that effectively means is that you're going to have a rise in consumption and you'll be able to export goods because right now, as for the past few decades, Africa has run this large and persistent trade deficit with China. China claims that they don't want to be running a trade surplus against Africa, but they haven't done much to change it. So if we are getting into a rebalanced economy, we actually have the opportunity for African exporters to tap into this latent consumption of China that just hasn't, it hasn't been awake in the entire you know, modern history of the Chinese economy. Okay, Mzukisi, Stephen has set the table for us in terms of what the issues are from China's side. Let's now flip the script and look at that from the African side. You've been thinking about this. You wrote about this in the LSE paper. You've also written about it in the context of Africa's relationship among the U.S., China, and various African countries in the geopolitics there. Tell us what you think the priorities should be from the African side going into FOCAC. Uh, FOCAC is taking place um, at a time when the uh, when the world um, is going through a a pandemic, uh, but also uh, taking uh, place against the backdrop uh, of uh, geopolitical tensions between the U.S. and um, and and China, intensifying geopolitical tensions. So, I, I my sense is that um, China will want to promote its its relationship with the African continent. It will want to, to deepen it. I, I don't think you're going to have the sort of big big bang announcements that you you had in the last you know for for CAC in twenty twenty one where you know sorry uh, twenty twenty eighteen where there was you know this sixty billion uh, US dollar financial package. But, but it's not going to be uh, muted either. Uh, so so they I think China will want to 
to show some muscle. It will want to make some emphatic steps uh, in, in, in projecting itself as an important uh, partner to, to the African continent. For Africans, I think it's going to be very important uh, that um, uh, they push uh, very strongly, and, and this links to the points uh, uh, Stefan made, uh, for market access, uh, for greater market access, uh, especially for agricultural uh, products. There are a few countries in, in Africa that, are, that have diversified uh, economic base, um, South Africa, or Egypt, uh, to some extent, Kenya, uh, and and I, and I think increasingly Nigeria. So, so I think China uh, offers great opportunity for African countries to uh, to create new avenues uh, for both agriculture and industrial products. Um, but given the limited muscle that individual African countries have. I think it's still important that they work collectively, they work together, and, and that they they start to uh, look more seriously at initiatives such as the African continental free free trade um, area as a common platform uh, for, for looking at opportunities abroad. There are a range of other areas that are going to be very important for the African continent, uh, especially in light of the disruptive nature of COVID-19 pandemic on the health care sector, uh, the, the heavy reliance of uh, the African continent on outsiders for vaccines. And I think these are, are some of the areas that um, China is going to make some big announcements uh, on, uh, as well as uh, perhaps finally um, on, on on the energy. B- building on some of the commitments that were made in 2018, but also with uh, pressure within China to shift away from paling uh, large investments uh, in coal-fired you know, power stations abroad. So, uh, so I see some emphasis on, on, on green technologies, on solar manufacturing, etc. As you mentioned, you know, this is, Fagok is happening this year against the background of, of heightened U.S. interest in, in, in China-Africa relations um, and also the launch of the B3W, the Build Back Better World initiative that's supposed to be rolling out infrastructure from the U.S. How optimistic do you think African leaders are about B3W? How like Do, do, do you foresee that it's it's changing their kind of thinking about their relationship with China or their, their, their interaction with the, with the Belt and Road Initiative in any way? It's very difficult to to read a collective uh, mindset of African policymakers uh, because even though you do have some of these joint efforts or common platforms uh, in the form of your regional economic communities or the AFCFTA, but by and large, uh, African leaders still uh, operate uh, quite parochially. So, uh, by and large, I think there they is they still confidence uh, in what platforms such as FOCA can deliver uh, or uh, to the African continent based on their previous track record. There isn't much conversations, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, in the African continent around the Build Back Better. I think many observers see it uh, as very much a domestic project and and also likely to gravitate the the U.S. to look more uh, inwardly uh, because this is a a large-scale infrastructure, interstate, uh, road, digital broadband, uh, initiative, pretty much speaking to the domestic audience. So I think China has an important uh, opening, especially for its digital Silk Road. It's part of the Belt and Road Initiative uh, to uh, trumpet its commercial diplomacy tied with its soft power uh, to the African continent. So, so I think I, I, I see a great window of opportunity for for China to consolidate its its primacy in in the in the African continent as as a as a foreign partner, but also for African for the African continent to leverage uh, these uh, uh, geopolitical tensions uh, to have more ask on China. I don't think you know. I, I think the the Africans need to shift their mindset away from just viewing themselves as you know as, as recipients of uh, benefits from from outside but but to look at their own uh, resources at their own latent capabilities and, and make an ask on the external on the major on the major powers uh, so so I, I do I do see I'm, I'm looking at the at the forecast 
somewhat positively and and i think there is more that can be harvested in in china africa relations on a range of issues from cyber to green technology to supporting industrial capacities in order to diversify africa's exports to to, to china but a lot really depends on on africans uh, you know how they structure their institutional bases uh, how they you know build their industrial policies uh, and and so on Stephen, let's stick with the question of infrastructure. In previous FOCAX, as Mzukisi said, there's been these big announcements of $60 billion, $20 billion, $60 billion, all of these big numbers that came out. Mzukisi mentioned, and I believe this is to be the case as well, that we're probably not going to get a massive mega number like that, but we probably will get a number that the Chinese can use as a sign of their commitment to the continent and also as a bludgeon to hit the United States and others to say, look at what we're doing. It's very useful to have these numbers. That being said, the data points over the past few years that lending from the Chinese Overseas Development Policy Banks, that is the China Exim Bank and the China Development Bank, has plunged. In Latin America, it went from $30, $40 billion for energy projects down to zero. Uh, Worldwide, overall, it went from $75 billion a year in 2016 to just $4 billion last year, and this year it's on track to be even less. The projects now that they're financing, rather than the standard gauge railway for $6 billion or big ports in Nigeria, multi-billion dollar initiatives as well, they're now in the tens of millions, hundreds of millions, but not in the billions. Talk to us a little bit about what you see in terms of development finance and whether China will bring that big checkbook to finance the badly needed infrastructure in Africa, or will they be more targeted along the lines of green, digital, and these very, very narrow niches of infrastructure, but really out of the big infrastructure business? Right. I, I would just caution one thing, which is that um, as as Muzukisi wrote in uh, his contribution to that report, China does keep the scorecard for FOCAC um, and the reliability of these numbers, of the $60 billion number from any year in the past, it's not something that we ought to read too much into. By the way, Ambassador Liu from the Chinese ambassador to the African Union just published last week that they've committed 85% of the $60 billion from the previous FOCAC. That's what they say. Right. So, so, we, have, we, so we have to hit, uh, what would that be? A little over $900 million in the next two weeks like there's there's still a good amount there's still a good amount uh, outstanding my take on it would be that not reading too much into the number that gets announced i personally wouldn't be surprised if we see 60 billion or something in that ballpark just because we're all sort of awaiting the symbolic nature of is china pulling back is china not i would expect i would fully expect there to be as you said this continued reshifting away from large infrastructure financing endeavors simply on the basis that these things China hasn't had as much exit success as it's wanted to have from them. And it's learning. China's a young creditor. It's a young investor. It hasn't had that many zones of experimentation where it's had tremendous amounts of success. And as they've shown through pulling back in some places, and granted only through some institutions, so the policy banks don't account for all of Chinese overseas overseas capital flows, they're learning. And it, it's much easier to learn when you're dealing in the in the 10 to $100 million range than in the $1 to $5 billion range. And, and at the same time, if there is going to be this shift, one of the big announcements from last month or the last couple months has been the end of coal financing overseas. If we're going to see a shift away from some of these heavy industry endeavors that China has become quite good at, it would make sense for us to pay more attention to the lighter footprint investments that you mentioned in the digital and green space. So it's tough to imagine there's going to be any sort of continuation of the SGR, of the of the Kenyan Railway, of the port in Nigeria. We, we've come a long and bruised way from that on the Chinese side. And given the developments at home, there's less appetite and perhaps also less capital to work with to, to undertake some of those investments. Ms. Kizi, um, Stephen pointed out that that you know that, that China is in this learning process. We also recently interviewed Tang Xiaoyang, who you know, who on, on about his book, which which is all about this kind of learning process, this kind of kind of what he calls pragmatic coevolution of China's kind of activities in in Africa. So there's you know there's there's this entire vocabulary of Chinese learning. 
thing, um, you know, kind of and passing like crossing the river by feeling the stones. All of these kind of like w- like ways of thinking about how they kind of uh, dynamically adapting their their approach to, to in Africa. What lessons do you think Africa is learning? Um, you know, kind of from from your experience of, of just watching it, like w- what you know, kind of h- how is Africa learning from its experiences of working with China so far? And what lessons do you think it like the 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 leaders of the continent should learn as they move into a new decade where where you know, kind of so, some of these sureties of how China works are are starting to fall away? Yeah, so thanks, uh, thanks, Kobas. Uh, quite a tough question. First, I must say I agree with uh, uh, Stephen Stephen. Uh, take uh, on on China and it's um, you know I, I, that's my sense as well that there isn't going to be big bank uh, infrastructure you know large scale infrastructure projects. So I was thinking of a number close to 60 billion because it, it, the optics would look bad if it's anything below that. Uh, and and is right that um, the Chinese can say anything in respect of. Uh, how close they are to fulfilling those commitments. I mean, they are the ones who keep the scorecard. So, um, but back to your question, I, I, you know, I think I think it's 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 a it's a correct observation that uh, China is learning by doing and adjusting as it as it goes along. Um, but, and again, when you think about uh, African policymakers, I think they've largely seen China as another benefactor that they can go to if they can't make headways to multilateral development banks or uh, other bilateral creditors uh, that have uh, far more stringent conditions uh, than China. I don't get a sense, a strong sense that the African elites uh, have been able to approach their relationship with China in a, in a very strategic way. And that includes, by the way, a major economy like South Africa. South Africa is one of the few countries that China has a strategic partnership agreement with. It has a long name, and there has not been not been much that is that has been strategic in that agreement. Uh, you know, on the a set of bilateral commitments that were made in respect of um, high value investments or high value products that South Africa could export to China. None of that, or very little of that, has has, has materialized. For South Africa in particular, uh, the fixation has been on this notion of state-to-state, sorry, party-to-party relations, where the ruling party, the African National Congress, would send delegation to China to learn about, you know, the uh, how China applies its com- its, its communist doctrine, uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics. Uh, then on the government side, it's uh, the, the obsession has largely been on the state-owned enterprises, how China manages its state-owned enterprises, um, not approaching this relationship in, in, a, in a critical or, or strategic way, but to simply want to take, to copy and paste what China has done without understanding the context, the, the history, and some of the constraints uh, that China is navigating as it does all of this. And, and that there's no cast in stone Chinese model. It's evolving over, over, over time and, and adapting you know, with the changing you know, global conditions. Um, so I, I wish that uh, the policymakers in Africa can learn lessons around building uh, institutions uh, that enable you uh, to manage your economic growth, that they can learn uh, best ways to think about industrial policies, uh, and and also about uh, how to accelerate implementation on uh, on policy measures that you already have in in, in place. Uh, so my sense is that they are learning all the wrong wrong lessons, and not paying attention to the critical. Uh, policy uh, steps that they need to take. But Mzukisi, how is this possible? Because it seems like in many ways that African policymakers in South Africa and elsewhere are treating China as if it's a new player in Africa, okay? China's been in Africa now at this level of engagement for two decades, and yet the level of knowledge and sophistication, as you're pointing out, still remains like it was back in 2003, 2004. It just doesn't feel like they have upgraded their understanding of China as much as China has upgraded its understanding of various African countries. 
I, I agree with that. Uh, precisely the point, uh, uh, Eric, that uh, they are learning selectively. Can you be precise when you say selectively? What are they learning and what are they ignoring? I think what they're learning is what suits their biases about uh, the need to build a big state and uh, to sort of move away from, say, Washington consensus and into a state-driven modes of development, sort of excessive, you know, de approach to economic development uh, without looking at whether you do, you have the right conditions for, for some of the actions you want to uh, to, to undertake. Uh, so I agree with you that uh, they uh, they have not evolved their, their understanding of China. And uh, one of the reasons why this is the case is that many African countries uh, within their institutional ensemble have not developed capacities, uh, that is bureaucratic capacities, to work on China. I mean, if you go to, say, your Department of Trade and Industry in South Africa, you are unlikely to find more than five experts on China. And I, and I guess this will probably also be the case if you go to the Department of Foreign Affairs, you know, your international relations and cooperation. So you, you need to, to build institutions that enable you to absorb economic intelligence, to absorb cultural intelligence and, and, and to, you know, to have an accurate understanding of how a major power like China uh, operates. And unlike the U.S., you don't have these non-state um, entities uh, that are fashioned like, you know, if you have someone like Hel Hank Paulson, who then goes and, and starts, you know, an institution that outside of the state, an institution that manages a relationship between China and South Africa. You don't have that uh, in many African countries. So, so the understanding or, or the knowledge is really rudimentary still. But let's not forget that 82,000 African students go to China to study every year, and they are generating PhDs and MBAs and masters. The human resources are there. They may not be tapping it, but they're there. Of uh, people who have language experience and in-country experience in China. I just, I don't know. It, it That's surprising to me. 20 years into this. That doesn't get absorbed into the state. Well, that's, again, that's their responsibility, and they should be held accountable for that, but it's not because the human resource isn't there. I suppose you have a point there. I suppose you have a point there. But if you don't use that knowledge as input uh, into state bureaucracy, then it's not going to work for you. Exactly. Exactly. Stephen, you know, kind of, we, we're in a moment where there, there's a lot of a lot of political changes in China, and then a lot of them are also impacting on the private sector in China. And uh, you know, so, so all these kind of crackdowns on 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 large companies or on on you know individuals, um, and then also the the kind of ongoing kind of pressures around around uh, debt and so on with within Chinese companies you know with with all of that there seems to be at, at the moment a kind of a mood in China that's a lot more in, in you know kind of inward looking and that's coupled with the fact that that Xi Jinping personally hasn't left China for a long time so I was wondering kind of how you know how you see that playing out in relation to the global south particularly um you know the like how does it change focac if Xi Jinping is not there and you know kind of and, and, and what does it do to this kind of to the, the the kind of optics and the kind of mode of 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 interaction that China has built with with global South countries and particularly with Africa? That's so much to do with this kind of like you know person to person kind of leaders in the same room kind of way of, of dealing with them. Um, you know, do do you see a kind of a, a, a shift in in emphasis in coming in in the next few years? So on the on the political side of things, I mean, we've had ministerial summits for FOCAC in the past. I wouldn't be too concerned concerned about Xi Jinping not being present. And I think that they've, you're absolutely right that it's been more inward looking just by the sheer nature of the crisis. There's a lot to tend to at home. The, you know, the COVID crisis, the Evergrande crisis, there, there are many things that require domestic attention. On the economic side, though, there are real concerns. So to drag back to something that's not too much in the Western consciousness, but the uh, China's financial crisis in 2014, 2015, that had big ramifications for the global South. And the the reason why, so in, in 2014, 2015, there was this stock market crash, 30% of the Shanghai Stock Market Composite Index um, was erased in a couple months. Um, but the reason why there was this crisis was because we had a slowdown in domestic industrial production in China. So, so China, it's not like the United States. If the United States or if the United Kingdom, if the European Union has a crisis, that's a big issue for the world because all of a sudden 
the big major consumer economies are no longer buying up the world's goods. Everyone's plunged into recession. With China, it's a bit different. China's no longer buying the industrial inputs of the world. So commodity prices were the things that collapsed. Yeah, but just on that point, um, uh, Kobas, the... I think the, the, that crisis also affected African countries in particular, especially resource-rich countries, exactly quite badly because of the you know the, they are they are tiered to to China as a market for uh, for commodities. So you you had many countries, um, uh, many African countries, exper- experiencing declines uh, in growth, and and there was an IMF paper. That was written uh, about the same time that showed that um, a fall, one percent fall in gro- in growth in China translate to, I think, zero point six percent fall in growth in uh, in resource rich African African countries. So I think that was quite um, quite massive. I don't know if you you agree. Yeah, no, ex- I cer- I certainly agree. I mean, the the oil price collapse was was extraordinary. I think it was. From around a hundred a hundred dollars a barrel of crude petroleum to about thirty between 2014 and 2016, so that's not going to hit every African country. But if I'm Angola, that's going to be extraordinarily painful. And when you have you know various debt contracts tied up in the price of oil, resource for infrastructure lending agreements of that nature, this this can be extremely destabilizing. So we're not seeing that at the moment. I think that a, a number of resource rich African countries have been insulated from some of the pressures of what's happening in China's own market um, simply because the entire world is reopening right now and commodity consumption is going up through the roof and people are talking about this this global super cycle but when that passes and you know the the energy the energy crisis that that we're experiencing around the world is is in part tied up with rising prices but when this passes which which will happen in the next you know 6 months to a year then we're going to see you know, whatever happens in China, whatever happens with China's industrial production, if China actually does pull back some of its industrial production, which sort of the whole world's expecting at this point, um, simply because the firms that do this industrial production, the, the property firms, the builders, they are all struggling with bankruptcy at the moment. If they stop building, if China stops growing in that way, that's going to spell a big crisis for exporters of everything from oil to copper to steel to aluminum. And that will reverberate throughout many countries in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Not all of them, you know, but many of them. And that's something, that's something to look out for on the, on the consumption side of, of the equation. Well, let's wrap up our discussion now with each of you giving us a forecast or some prediction or something for us to think about when FOCAC gets underway in two weeks. What are you going to be looking for? And Zucchisi, let's start with you. What's the one or two things that you think we should be paying attention to when FOCAC gets underway? Difficult to really say what one particular uh, thing to look out for. I think, I mean, if you look at the last forecast, there was this, um, you know, compact of of eight initiatives from industrial to infrastructure connectivity, trade facilitation, you know, green development, uh, healthcare. So I, I I expect pretty much the same. I don't see any you know, major, major issue uh, that I, I think the, the climate issues will be included because they just fresh. But in terms of the core agenda, those are the themes I think will, you know, will, will be flighted. Uh, as, I, mean, I don't think there is going to be something really massive, especially because the, the question that was posed to uh, to Stefan, this is not at the head of, head of state's uh, level. Um, so, and because of that, you, you may have uh, much more measured, uh, much more sort of realistic uh, packaging of, 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 the, of the agenda and, and the out- outcomes, therefore. But just the last point, the, the final point on this, um, just building on the point that uh, Stefan made, I don't think we should be worried about the fact that um, Xi Jinping is not going to be there because in any case, uh, FOCAC is a diplomatic platform. So a lot of the commitments and the pledges are usually done beforehand. You know, they're usually tied up beforehand. And, and crucially, China has never been much of a fan of doing deals at a, at, at a multilateral level, that is Africa multilateral. This is important for their soft power, for their projection of 
uh, significance. Uh, but China often works out the business detail at the bilateral at the bilateral level. So for me, it's not much of a worry that uh, Xi Jinping is not is not going to be there, and this is downgraded to a ministerial. Stephen, let's get your prediction. So first, I mean, coming off the heels of the COP summit, I, I'm certainly paying attention to whatever comes in the way of clean energy investments in sub-Saharan Africa. The continent definitely needs energy. There's been this pivot from Western countries on financing fossil fuels. China said that it won't finance coal. But hopefully that doesn't mean that we're going to have a decline in foreign financing of all of, of African energy and energy infrastructure investments. So that's that will be a big that will be a big thing to monitor. Um, Beyond this, I'm very curious about the African side. We've seen a good deal of progress on the uh, African Continental Free Trade Agreement, and there's definitely room for further um, economic integration and political integration in the sense of banding together to best represent African interests vis-a-vis -vis China, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Paris Club of creditors. So, so seeing how they're able to perhaps mount a collective response to China-Africa trade issues. Um, as I mentioned, Africa continues to run a trade, a trade deficit with China. China claims that they don't want to do that. But we're going to need to see Africa find a way to you know, uh, advocate for greater consumption within China, um, cleave open market access. And then, you know, seeing if there's any way to, to collectively band together and, and make a common statement on debt issues. Uh, it's not entirely clear what they would be advocating for exactly to the Chinese. The Chinese position is, is pretty, pretty clearly entrenched. But to just keep that, as you mentioned, your frustration at the top of the show, just to keep that on the radar, um, because these issues aren't, aren't going away anytime soon. And you know, as we're as we're seeing right now, as the dollar strengthens, as interest rates rise in the in Western countries, uh, debt servicing costs are only going to get more and more painful in Sub-Saharan Africa. So that issue is not going away at all, and I think that FOCAC is going to be a very important opportunity, and I hope an opportunity that is seized for African countries to make sure that it stays at the top of the agenda. And somehow to get it, you know, push it between the United States and China, so that you have both countries vying for, for favor in terms of debt relief or uh, financing support, SDR reallocations towards these countries. Something that will that will help them weather this storm. The collection of papers by LSC and the China Foresight team is FOCAC at 21, Future Trajectories of China-Africa Relations. Stephen Paduno, who's the executive director of the LSC Economic Diplomacy Commission, he wrote the paper, Can China Pull Back? A Balance of Payments, Assessments of the Decline in China's Overseas Investment. Stephen, thank you so much for taking the time to explain all of this to us and to lay it all out. I know you're active on Twitter, and if people want to follow what you're reading and writing, where can they find you? Yep, it's at Stephen Paduano on Twitter. Very easy. We'll put a link to your paper and to your Twitter handle in the show notes below. And Mzukizi Kobo is the head of the Witz School of Governance at Witz University in Johannesburg. And his contribution to the LSE collection of papers was Africa's Priorities at FOCAC, Economic Recovery and Resilience. Mzukizi, are you on Twitter by any chance? Uh, no, I'm tech. I'm technologically challenged. <laughs> so. Wow, you're the one person left that's not on Twitter. Fantastic. God bless you. You are a smart man. <laughs> you are a very smart man. But we will put a link also to uh, Mzukisi's excellent book. If you have academic privileges, then you can get into libraries. He wrote this great collection of essays on the political economy of China-U.S. relations. That is awesome. Uh, really just a fascinating read as well. We'll put all of that in the show notes. And Zukisi, Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks to you and Kobas. Thanks, Eric. Wow, so much to take in there from both Stephen and Mzukisi. Uh, let's go back to this question of the number, because that's been one of the mysteries leading into FOCAC, is whether the Chinese will come out with yet another big number, 20, 40, 60 billion dollars. I tend to agree with Mzukisi, that they are going to come out with a 60 billion number or some big number like that because the Chinese love numbers at these kinds of events. So it's just something that they do at a lot of their events. You know, at the recent uh, import expo, they said, we've signed this much in deals. At the recent China-Africa Economic and Trade Expo, they talked about they signed, I think, 20 or $30 billion in deals, some really big number. So I do think they like the number. The key thing, though, is to look at the number. 
And scholars did this in between the 2015 and the 2018. The headline was $60 billion, but the way that they got to $60 billion was very, very different. And oftentimes, a lot of the headlines don't go beyond just that superficial accounting for $60 billion. But it can be previous deals, it can be export credits, it can be lots of different ways to account for $60 billion. And I think that's the point that maybe Mzukisi was trying to get to, which was, yeah, it may be a big number, but it's not going to be a big deal. Yeah, you know, kind of the the number the number will have to be kind of disaggregated and, and looked at. Um, and you know, I can I can well imagine that it might be kind of cobbled together in order to not have the the big talking point of this year's FOCAC be well, China didn't announce a number. You know, um, so yeah, so 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 I think it's it's always good to kind of take the number with a, with a grain of salt. Um, it will be very interesting though to see where the weight of of the commitments fall. You know, and and whether, for example, you know, kind of how much attention is paid to market access in China, and how much attention is paid to to green energy kind of investment, um, particularly in the context of, of of the cancellation of coal. You know, um, so I think one of one of the things I think I will probably be looking at is is to which extent is this FOCAC a moment where the China Africa energy relationship is starting to is kind of like with the takes a first step in a new direction and to which extent are we still going to be dealing with the old China Africa energy you know relationship which which was kind of thrown in in in, in disarray to a certain extent by the the coal announcement I think there's a lot of enthusiasm in China for the new green initiatives, and I would expect to see a lot of investment there and a lot more engagement from the Chinese private sector in this space. So we may not see the big Chinese state-owned enterprises to be as active in this, but this is where I think we're going to see a lot more activity from uh, the private sector. And I, when, we got, when we talked to Wu Peng, who is the top Chinese diplomat for Sub-Saharan Africa, this was one thing that he led on, that there will be more engagement from the private sector. And, and I think that is, a, to me, a very healthy evolution of the broader China-Africa relationship. The more the state can kind of pull out of it, the more that the private sector and people-to-people exchanges can, can flourish, to me, that's a great direction to go in. This, right now, at this moment that we're in, is a great time to pivot to do more of that. Let's see if that happens. But I, I would think that the, there's a lot of energy and a lot of excitement, no pun intended, on the energy side for this more sustainable forms of solar, even to some extent hydro, which I know you're not a big fan of, but renewable energies. Yeah, I really hope so. I mean, it'll be very, you know, like the the a greater engagement from the private sector will also, and like I, I expect, will also include greater engagement from Chinese private lenders. Um, you know, and and one might well see a lot of a lot of this kind of financing for these for these uh, initiatives to come through non traditional financiers, i.e., not not the policy banks, China Development Bank and China Exim Bank, um, but through other financiers. So that'll be interesting it'll also then add to the complexity of 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 the landscape that we're seeing now where you know kind of where for example like deborah brautigam recently you know when we interviewed her pointed out that that there's 18 different chinese lenders involved in the zambian debt situation um you know so 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 that you know clearly it, it africa is going to have to kind of develop more capability to deal with chinese private lending um and to, to deal with all of these different kind of entities including state-owned enterprises and other kind of companies and so on who also act as lenders um you know particularly when it comes to to green energy because green energy in in the chinese space is is the the private companies are a lot stronger than the state-owned enterprises so you you know, so so that's I think going to be a new set of challenges for Africa in, into the next few years. But I really hope that they have an announcement on debt, something that is that just moves the needle forward. They have an opportunity to do something great here and to take advantage of the fact that again the rest of the international community is is seems to be very comfortable in in letting these countries kind of get buried under their debt. And that is just the reality of what it is. Even, you know, the United States has not taken a leadership role on this. And I know people in Washington will say there's not much that they can do. That's not true. There's a lot of of governance issues in the United States that can be done. There's a lot of pressure that can be brought by the U.S. government to the IMF and the World Bank. You know, at this point, nobody seems to be really taking it that seriously. They could have done it at the G20 and moved it up the priority list, which they didn't do. And I think to Mzukisi's point, 
that the Biden administration right now is driven by domestic politics. It was interesting to see how he more or less dismissed B3W, that he didn't really th- seem to take it that seriously, that it was more of a domestic issue. And I get the sense that there's not an enormous amount of excitement in Africa today about B3W. Yeah, you know, I mean, we still have to see what it's what it even it's going to be. Um, and there's been so, so many kind of big talk initiatives announced you know over the last few years that that this could be one more of them um you know it, it, i mean it'll be great if it's not you know but <laughs> but still you know kind of that 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 still has to be proven but you got a sense of my frustration of the fact that they don't have enough china expertise within their their governments and you've recognized this at some recent conferences that you've been to where a lot of the thinking from some senior level stakeholders is from 10 15 years ago so this and, and again, to me, that's just unacceptable given where we are right now and how you don't even need to have the expertise on site. There are virtual ways to, to get that expertise again. But you have this real giant, enormous pool of, of talent of people who have in-country experience, language experience, PhDs in some cases, lots of knowledge, trade experience. And they're not tapping it, as Mukisi said. I mean, it's just it, to me, that means you're just bringing the problems on yourself to some extent. Yeah, yeah, and it, it, you know, kind of, and then that, that it's, it's so bad for African societies as a whole, um, you know, but, but that, that is one of the big problems is that, is that, you know, African governments frequently find it very difficult to, to take, to take advantage of, of African human capital, you know, and so, so you end up having all these African PhDs living in cities around the world, um, you know, kind of, and not, not kind of working in, in their own countries, um, you know, so so yeah, that's a big problem. I mean, it, it's also it's also like an issue, as you said. Like, you know, I was I was recently in a room with a bunch of African policymakers, and one of them was like, you know, kind of was essentially saying, I, I'm trying to remember her exact words, was saying that that you know, as if it's a big announcement that you know, kind of like it's time for Africa to to start kind of not thinking about China that, or, or starting to assume that China isn't in Africa for just for altruistic reasons. And I was like, did you ever think China is in Africa for altruistic reasons? I mean, did you think that anyone is in Africa for altruistic reasons? Like, how is that even a thing? Um, but that framing is just surreal because what country, yeah, any country like, behaves for altruistic reasons? It's like, how how can a policymaker be that removed from reality? It's, you know, it's not even reality in relation to China specifically. It's reality in relation to Africa's external relationships around the world. Like, no one engages with Africa altruistically. I mean, come on. You know, the, Africa's experience has been the least altruistic in the world. So, But that's not unique to Africa, by the way. Mm-hmm. Again, mm-hmm. I don't know where altruism exists in international relations. Maybe I'm more of a realist in that sense, but I, I know a lot of people think that their countries be, behave benevolently, but at the end of the day, national interests do drive decisions, in my view. So I think that's just a level of naivete. That is part of the problem here, is that... Th- they're not engaging the Chinese with the level of sophistication that I think that they require. That being said, the knowledge level on the Chinese side, which I have seen over the past 20 years, has gone up enormously. Back in the early 2000s, you know, China had an Africa policy. It looked at the continent as one. It was very unsophisticated. But as we've heard over and over again from the experts we've talked to, they have been learning. They have been taking in these lessons. They're now teaching people to, to speak the local languages. You see the, that they now have regional and national level and subnational expertise that's been built up. And, and if you're not keeping up with that, again, when you're doing the negotiations with the other side, if they have more knowledge than you do, well, then you're going to get the shorter end of the stick. And that's unfortunate because, again, I do see this giant pool of amazing talent that's there. So we'll, I, won't, I won't keep going on about it, but it just frustrates me because you and I come across so many great young people who have so much experience and want to apply that and would love to have the opportunity to work for their governments, to enhance their negotiating positions, to really bring up the knowledge level, close those knowledge deficits on China. The opportunity's there. They're not taking it. So let's leave the conversation there. Just a quick programming note for all of you. During FOCAC, the days 28, 29, 30, on 29, 30, and possibly the first, we're going to do bonus episodes where Cliff, Cobus, and I are just going to do a quick recap of everything we've seen just to keep you up to date on what's going on. So we'll put those into the podcast feed. We're also going to do some bonus episodes for our Patreon subscribers and Patreon members. So if you want to join our Patreon community to get 
these bonus episodes. We're doing a pre-FOCAG Zoom call, and we'll do a post-FOCAG Zoom call. Plus, we have the weekly digests all going into our Patreon community. Go to patreon.com slash China Africa Project. And if you are hardcore and you want the daily email brief that is going out to scholars and senior policymakers around the world, go to ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. You'll get full access to the website with thousands of articles in the archive, plus, of course, the daily brief. So lots of options to keep informed on this. Maybe, Cobus, some of these African governments should sign up for the newsletter. (laughs) <laughs> that might be a good place to start. So, you know, you know, hopefully someone from a various uh, African ministries are listening. We'd love to make sure that you guys get this. So anyway, let's leave the conversation there. Cobus and I will be back again next week. We're going to focus on China-Africa trade next week, going into FOCAC and what some of the key trade issues should be. We're really excited to have the team from Development Reimagined to be with us. So stay tuned for that. Until then, for Cobus van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. For more information about the China Africa Project, go to chinaafricaproject.com. <laughs>